Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, good morning. We are so glad that you're here this morning. If you're watching online, thank you for uh, participating online. And uh, I, I, now I'll, I'll speak for myself. Uh, praise team, thank you. Praise man, thank you. I like them on stage. I, I really do. It, 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 it sounds great with them on stage. So I, I think that was a great move. Great move to go on stage. Would you pray with me? Father, we just rejoice in you. We cry out to you and just let you know that you are our strength. You are our hope. Lord God, you have unfailing love. And we praise you for that. Father, thank you for the fact that as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can come together and we can worship you. We can cry out to you. We can encourage one another. And so, Lord God, we come to you, um, some of us with heavy burdens, some of us with concerns in our hearts, and knowing, Lord God, that you say, cast your cares on me because I care for you, knowing that you care for us, and knowing, Lord God, that we can agree as brothers and sisters in Christ as we lift our requests to you. Father, we pray that you would just continue to do a work in this church. We cry out for those who are on their sick bed, those who, Lord God, can't make it out. We pray that you would give them grace and strength and you would encourage them, that, Lord God, you would meet them where they are, that they may sense your love and your presence in their life. I think, Lord God, of the Cooper family and I think of the Serace family and those, Lord God, who are fighting sicknesses. I pray for healing, if that be your will. Father, we thank you for this ministry, this school ministry, and we pray that you continue to bless it and use it, Lord God, to reach students, boys and girls, for Jesus Christ and for families for Jesus Christ. We pray for strength of our faculty and staff and teachers and administration. We pray, Lord God, that you would guard them, protect them, and that you'd use them to do a mighty work. Father, we pray that you would help us as Grace Brethren Christ, uh, Christian Church, Grace Brethren Church, to reach this neighborhood. My cry, Lord God, is that we would not just be a, uh, a destination or a spot to give directions, but we would really have an impact on this community. And so lead us and guide us in that direction. Father, I pray now as we open up your word that you would speak, uh, Lord, to us. I, I remember to pray also for uh, the Ukraine, for the leadership, for the Christians there, for the church there. I pray, Lord, if be your will, you'd, you'd bring an end to this. Uh, but we would see people coming to know Jesus Christ. We pray for those in Chad, as we heard about just persecution of Christians there, brothers and sisters there. And we pray that you would, Lord God, meet the needs. We pray for those in Puerto Rico who have suffered, and Bermuda and, and those other places who have suffered tragedy. We pray that you'd meet them. So open our hearts to hear your word. Lord God, may you speak through me in spite of me by the person of your Holy Spirit that we may hear from you and not just be hearers, but we may be doers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I hope you're glad to be in the house of the Lord today, and I uh, hope you're excited about uh, hearing what God has to say to you this morning. So if you have your Bibles, take them and turn with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 1 through uh, 10 in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and uh, this, is, this is an unusual passage, and I'll tell you why, because Paul shares something in this passage with the Corinthians that he doesn't share anywhere else. He sort of opens up himself and allows him to look, let them to look back in their past and he shares a part that, is, that has been hidden and kept quiet for a long time, but he does it to encourage them. And so as we look at this, we're going to get a glimpse of what Paul says. And, 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 and the interesting thing is, is there is application to what Paul says for us today, that we can learn something about what Paul went through and about what we go through and how to apply those things. So... 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and 
what happens here in, 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 in chapter 12, he begins to share this thing. In, in the book of 2 Corinthians, from the time 1 Corinthians was written to 2 Corinthians, there have been some people who had gotten into the church who claimed to have apostolic authority. And they claimed that Paul was really either an imposter or he didn't have the authority that he claimed. And so part of the first, second Corinthians, the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul spends defending himself defending who he is and his calling and all those things. And so what you have here, as he begins to d defend himself, and, and, and in chapter 11, what he does, as, the, as, he, as, he, as he's talking about these opponents that are, that are facing him, he goes through a list in chapter 11. We're not going to read today, but you take time to read chapter 11. And he lists all the things that he had gone through as an apostle, all the tragedies he's gone through, all the times he's been beaten and left for dead. He begins listing all these things, and then he says, he says there in verse 5, in verse 5, 30 of chapter 11, he says, If I must boast, I will boast in the things that show my weaknesses. Paul, I really don't want to brag. I'm not saying these things to brag, but if I'm going to brag about anything, I'm going to brag about the things that are going to show where I come short. I'm going to brag about my weaknesses. Because in bragging about my weaknesses, I'm honoring God. Is what, he, is what he's saying there. So when you get to chapter 12, he says, if I must go on boasting, if I'm going to continue to boast, though there is nothing to be gained by it, I'm not getting any gain by this boasting, I will go on to visions and revelations in the Lord. And so apparently these opponents that were in the church were bragging about having visions and getting revelations from the Lord. The, the idea of revelation is an uncovering. It is a revealing of a ministry. And they were bragging about these things. And Paul said, now really, I really don't want to brag about these things. But since you're saying that these are things that are needed to uh, prove my apostleship, I'm going to tell you about them. And he begins to tell us about these, these things. And, and I think there's a couple of reasons why he does it. The first reason he does it is because he is exposing the pride of his opponents in the church. He deals with this thing humbly, and he's exposing the fact that they're running around telling everybody what their visions and revelations are, right? He's exposing their pride. I think the other reason he does it is because he wants to encourage us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 say this, Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort by which we ourselves are comforted by God. I think one of the reasons Paul is sharing this is because he wants to comfort us. It's interesting what God says there. He says is this, that sometimes God takes us through afflictions and takes us through things and brings us through things so that then we can turn around and help somebody else who's going through the things that we just went through, right? And I think that's what Paul's doing. He wants to encourage us through this. And I think the other reason is, I think the Holy Spirit's leading him. I think the Holy Spirit has led him to share this. Again, he's not shared this with anyone else. He's not shared this with any other church. But the Holy Spirit, as he's being led by the Holy Spirit, is leading him to share this experience that he has. He goes on in verse 3, verse 2. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And so as Paul begins to share his experience, he actually speaks in the third person because he does not want to cause them to look at him in any different way. In his humility, he speaks in the third person. I know a man who this happened to who was called up into the third heaven. Now, you have to understand, when the Bible describes about the heavens, the first heaven is our atmosphere here, right? This is the atmosphere that we live in. The second heaven is the atmosphere where the stars and the suns and the moons and the planets are. That's the second heaven, right? The third heaven, as the Bible describes the third heaven, third heaven is the dwelling place of God. And Paul says that I was, I was called up, or he said 14 years ago, I was caught up 
into the third heaven. I don't know whether it was in the body. This was an inner body or an outer body experience. I'm not sure what it was, but God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but God knows. Verse 5. And on behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except in my weaknesses. I, I'm telling you because I really feel I need to tell you, but I want you to know I'm really hesitant to tell you because the only things I really want to boast about are the areas where I'm weak. And he's, 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 he's showing a drastic comparison to these other people in the church who are running around sharing their rev revelations, right? And in fact, if this had been today, you know what they would have done? They, they, they would have taken their visions and their revelations, and they would have written a book about it. And they would have created seminars about it. They would have run around the country telling people how you could have the same revelation and visions. They would have done all that. Paul said, that's not me. That's not me. In fact, I really don't want to share this with you, but I'm feeling led by the Spirit to share this with you. And I don't want you to think anything else of me as a result of what I'm sharing. He says in verse 6, I'm sorry, verse, go to verse 4, and he heard the things, I skipped verse 4, and he heard the things that cannot be told which man cannot utter, right? So Paul is saying, what I saw in this vision, either they can't be told because I'm sorry, in fact, he doesn't even mention what he saw. He mentions what he heard, right? He said, I'm describing to you what I heard, not what I saw. He says, if I, if, I could, if I could translate for you what I heard, you wouldn't understand it. So, so apparently th th there is no language that can adequately translate what Paul heard, right? Or somehow God told him, don't share this. And so he shares this vision, but he doesn't get into the details of what's being said. And it's interesting that God, for some reason, God does not, did not want us or anybody who read this to know what it was exactly that Paul heard. Verse 6. Though I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I reframe it from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees or hears me to be. Now, that's really sort of a slight. What Paul's saying is, you know what? I really don't want to boast, but I want you to know if I did boast, I, I wouldn't be a fool because I'm telling the truth in comparison to the people who are running around the church boasting about everything that they, they, they said they saw, right? Basically, Paul's calling them fools. Is what, is what he's saying on, 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 on the back side of that. He's, he's throwing shade at him. He's, he's, throwing, he's saying that they're, they're fools. He says, I'm not, I'm not sharing this with you to impress you. I don't want to impress you with this as he begins to share here. So in verse 7, what we have in verse 7 is what Paul shares. And he talks about, in verse 7, a thorn in the flesh. Look what he says there. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, plural, a thorn, in the, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. So we know he talks about this thorn. Now, one thing we understand this thorn, what he's saying is it's from God. This thorn that he has, he says, God did it. God is trying to keep me from being conceited. God did it, but it was delivered by Satan. God gave it to him, but God used Satan to deliver it. God used Satan to deliver it. To, to, to deliver this thing. And so, and, so, and so he says there, in verse 7, he says, a thorn was given to me in my flesh. 
Well, we learned in the book of Job, we remember when, when Job and God, when God, God had, and Satan had this challenge, and Satan says, you know what, God, the reason Job is praising you because you protected you, you take his protection away, and he will curse you to his face, right? And God said to Satan, God said, well, go ahead and do it. Go ahead. And, and, and in Job chapter 1, verse 12, it says, And God said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch forth your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. What that tells us is this, is that God, God is sovereign over the devil. The devil cannot do anything to any, any child of God unless he gets God's permission to do it. He's sovereign over the devil, right? And God is so sovereign over the devil that God can use the devil to do his work. Isn't that something? God brought it on Job, but God used Satan to deliver what God was giving to Job. God, God has that much, that much power and authority, he, use, he can use the devil to do this. So let's talk about the stake. So when you hear this, this verse, sometimes you say you think of a thorn was given to me. We think of a rose bush, right? You ever prick your finger on, on a rose bush, right? This is not the word for rose bush. The word that's used here is a word that means a sharp instrument that was oftentimes used by, in surgery. It was oftentimes used as a, a weapon uh, to stab someone. It was used sometimes to, to stake a tent. Remember, Paul was a tent maker, right? And so that, what would happen, these, these sharp instruments, they would take and pound them in the ground. And so when he's talking about this, this thorn, it is something that is sharp and lethal. And he says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, my body was given to me, and he says there a, he says there a messenger of Satan to harass me or to buffet me. And that word buffet means, it has the idea to, to strike with the fist, to hit. An uh, enemy was of Satan, God, an uh, enemy, a messenger of Satan was given to buffet me. And, 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 and the verb phrase there means it was something that was continual. Now remember what he says there. He says, this happened 14 years ago. When this took place, now we're not exactly sure when that was. It could have been sometime after his conversion, sometime before he went out on his, his missionary journey, or maybe a short time after that. But he had this experience some time ago, and 14 years ago, there was this messenger that was given to buffet him, and he's not told what this messenger is. And so many people have speculated as to what this is. Some people think that it was headaches that maybe Paul had headaches or Paul had migraines. Some people think it may, he may have uh, epilepsy. Uh, others think it was malaria, some kind of malarial fever. Others feel it was a physical pain, some type of physical pain, which, which as you read that, the, the tool that is used does seem to suggest it's some kind of physical pain or pain that Paul had to bear as he went through this. Others feel it was his loss of his eyesight. If you look through some of Paul's writings, you realize that actually there's someone else who is transcribing his letters, right? In fact, in one part, he says, I wrote this with my own hand. And so some people think that this may be his eyesight. But the issue is he doesn't tell us what it was. And I often wonder, did the people he wrote the book to know exactly what it was? If it was something physical, maybe they say, yeah, I've been wondering about that. I wonder what that was, right? But, but we're not sure. He doesn't tell us what it was, and I think it's important that he doesn't tell us where it was. The fact that he does not tell us what this thorn was allows us to be able to apply it to things that we go through, right? Had he told us the thorn was my eyesight, then we say, okay, if I had the eye problem, that's the thorn, but other things would not apply to it. And so he does not give them exactly what this thorn is, but he has had this thorn from the time he's writing this book. He's had this thorn for 14 years. And it is a repeated thing. It is something that continues. It's something that he is dealing with day in and day out. And he says, I understand that it's something that God gave me. Now, why did God give it to him? Well, verse 7 tells us this. He gives it to him for this reason. He says in verse 7, So to keep me from becoming conceited or proud. 
to keep me from becoming proud, God gave this thorn. Now, why would Paul be proud? Because of these great revelations that God has given him. God allowed him in some way to go up into paradise and to view and take a tour of heaven. And to keep me from becoming proud, he gave me these thorns. Now, here's something that we all deal with, isn't it? It's pride. The Bible says that, that, that pride comes before the fall. And so what God wanted to do, God wanted to prevent Paul from becoming proud that he could use him. Let me tell you what Psalm says about, uh, Proverbs 16, 18 says about pride. I'm sorry, Proverbs 6, 16 and 18 says about pride. There are six things the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination. The first one he mentions is haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives wicked plans, feet that, are, that make haste to do evil. He says these things God hates. But the first thing it says that God hates is pride. Satan was kicked out of heaven because of pride. Because he said, I will... I will exceed the amount of God. He wanted God's worship. It was pride. And so what pride does, pride prevents us from being used of God. The story is told about Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was taking a plane trip uh, somewhere, and so he's on the plane. He's sitting in first class, and the stewardess came by, and the stewardess said, Mr. Ali, you're going to have to buckle your seatbelt. And she went on back to the plane. She came back, and seatbelt was still unbuttoned, still, still unlocked. He said, he said, Mr. Ali, you're going to have to button your seatbelt. We can't take off until you button your seatbelt. So she went again and came back, and the seatbelt was still, un was still undone. He said, Mr. Ali, we're on the tar tarmac. We have to take off. You have to button up your seatbelt or buckle up your seatbelt. In which Ali looked at her and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And she said to him, Superman don't need no plane either. <laughs> <laughs> right? Sometimes our pride can get in the way. And so he's trying to stop Paul from pride. The second thing he's doing is this. He's trying to keep him dependent upon God. He's trying to keep him dependent upon God. And so what, what this does, what happens is we receive God's grace through dependency not independency. We receive God's grace through dependency. And so God has put this thing in his life. Whatever this thing is, is because he wants Paul to stay dependent upon him. Isn't it interesting how, how we start off good sometimes, and all of a sudden we're under God's dependency. We realize we need God, and all of a sudden, as things are going well, we sort of step out and we realize, ah, I think I can do this on my own, right? As if something has to happen to bring us back under God's dependency. That's why, that's why in John chapter 15, it says, it says there, it say, it, 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 he says there that without me, you can do what? Nothing. We are dependent upon God. And so he, he wants them to know that you are depend, we, we're dependent upon him. Now, the next thing is this. Verse 8, Paul prays. And Paul, pray, he shares his prayer. He says there in verse 8, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Paul said three times I cried out and I pleaded. And, 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 and I'm, I'm trying to imagine Paul doing this. This, this wasn't a fly-by-night prayer. Lord, please take this away. I believe Paul was on his face and crying and begging and saying, three times I'm praying that you would, that you, that you would take this away. And he's asking God to take it away. He's saying to the Lord, Lord, I want you to give me health and not sickness. I want you to give me peace and not torment. I want you to give me deliverance and not pain. I am crying out to you. You ever been there? You ever been there with something that is burdening you so much? Something that, whether it's physical or mental or emotional, or psychological, whatever it is, is burdening you so much that you can't do anything else but cry out to God. Paul says, three times I cried out to God. And he would, probably would have cried out more, but God gave him an answer. 
We're told in the, in, in, in the Gospels that Jesus, when he went to the garden, he says there he prayed three times in the garden. And he prayed as if the, the, the sweat was like blood coming from him. That's how intense he prayed. And he, and, and, the, and he tells us what he prayed. He said, Lord, if there's any other way that these people can be saved without me going to the cross, let that happen. But nevertheless, not my will but thine. As he faced the cross, he prays. The Bible says he prays. So he's crying out to God. Daniel, the Bible says Daniel would cry out to God three times a day. Three times a day, he would go up in his chamber and open his window toward Jerusalem, and he would cry. Now, I, I'm not saying there's something special about three. I think, I think Paul prayed until he got an answer, but he cries out here. He says, I want you to know I prayed to God three times. In other words, what Paul is telling us is he practiced what he preached. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, through what? Through prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Paul practiced what Paul preached, and he cries out to God. And in verse, in verse 9, he gets God's answer. In verse 9, he gets God's answer. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God gave him a three-part answer. The first part of the answer was this. No. No. Lord, I'm crying. Take this thing away. No. God answers no. God, God says, no, no, Paul, I want you to know I, I am not going to take it away. And see what happens with us? When God tells, how many of you like being told by no by God? It's not fun, is it? Right? Right? But when God tells us no, we, we, sometimes we won't accept no. We, just, we, I, we pretend like we don't even hear it. And we just continue at, and it gets, okay, God, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it myself. And why don't we do it ourselves? We make a mess, don't we? We make a mess. And so God says no, and so Paul has to understand the answer is no. And as you read through the book, you read through Paul's life, when Paul gets this answer and God's answer is no, you never hear of Paul asking again. He accepts the no. Why does he accept the no? He accepts the no because he knows that the person who is telling him no knows what is best for him. And that's sort of hard, isn't it? Because oftentimes we go to God and we already have in our mind what's best and what needs to be done. And so when he tells us no, we can't accept that because, Lord, we understand it, and my plans is superior to your plan, and we're going to work my plan out. He understands that God knows what is best, even though I don't understand it, even though I don't like it, even though it doesn't make me comfortable, even though I'm not being happy, I understand that I can trust God. Romans 8, 28, for all things work to the good together for the good of them who love God. I can trust this God who is going to work everything out for my good, even this issue I'm struggling with, even this burden I'm carrying. God's going to work it out, and I can trust him. So he accepts the no. The second thing he says there is this. He says, he gives him a message, and he says, my grace is sufficient. The, the word sufficient means enough. It means all that you need. Everything you're going to need to deal with this. I'm not going to take it away, Paul. But I'm going to give you the grace. I'm going to give you all the grace you are going to need. Now, what is grace? Grace is God's favor. Grace is, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And what he's saying there is, I have an abundance of grace. That's what the Bible says in Romans uh, 520, he says this, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. You will never exhaust God's grace. In fact, one commentator said it like this. He said, it's like a, a fish swimming in the ocean, being afraid that he might drink the ocean dry. 
You ever been on a ship in the ocean? Right? In other words, God is never, 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 never run out of grace. There is always going to be sufficient grace. No matter what the issue is, no matter what the situation is, there is always going to be sufficient grace. And the issue is this. I will never realize the sufficiency of God's grace until I realize that my grace is insufficient. As long as I think I'm sufficient, as long as I think I can work this out, I can do this, I'll never experience God's sufficient grace. Because it happens as I, as I, as I lose myself, as I come to an end of myself. The third thing he says in this message, and God's answer is this. Not only, not only is he answering no, not only is my, my grace sufficient, but he says, I also have strengthening grace. My grace is not only sufficient, but it is strengthening grace. See, there's two, there's two ways to deal with the burden. There's two ways to deal with the burden. One of them is you remove it. The other one is you strengthen the shoulder that carries it. Either I remove the burden or I strengthen the shoulder that carries. Now, we know in the body of Christ, we're, we're told to help carry each other's burdens, right? In other words, someone else comes along and helps you carry the burden that you're dealing with. But I straight, and so what Paul is saying here, what God's answer to him was this. I am going to strengthen your shoulder. I'm not going to remove the burden. But I'm going to give you the strength to bear the burden. I'm going to give you the strength to deal with the burden. And this is an amazing strength. And this strength, get this, this, this strength, what, what is this? God's grace turns on God's strength. And it is only turned on when we become weak. God's grace turns on God's strength, and he only turns it on when you and I become weak. Wearsby says this. He says, strength that knows itself to be strength is actually weakness. Weakness that knows itself to be weak is actually strength. God said, I'm going to turn on my strength. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 29, he says this. He gives power to the faint, and to them who have no might, he increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young man shall be exhausted. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings like eagles. And they shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Strength comes from weakness. Paul, this is what God's teaching me. It is when I am weak, when I feel that I can't go on, when I have exhausted all of, my, all of my power, all of my energy, all of my efforts, all of my know-how, that is when God's grace turns on God's strength, and that strength is supplied to us. So strength, strength does that. In, 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 uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says this. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to claim that anything is coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant. My sufficiency, my strength, my ability, the idea, my ability is not in ourselves. It's in God. And when we get to that place, when we learn that, that is when God's grace kicks in. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, when you put that together, what we're learning in 2 Corinthians, what he's saying is this, I can do all things when I realize I can't do all things through the God who gives me grace, who turns on the strength, to strengthen me. Does that make sense? 
And so he says, we have to understand that it's through weakness that we get this strength. So let's look at Paul's response. Look at Paul's response in verse 9. Back in 2 Corinthians 12. Look at Paul's response. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. Notice what he didn't do. He didn't, he didn't get bitter. He didn't give up. He didn't quit. He didn't say, I'm just, okay, Lord, you're not going to do it. I'm just going to grit and I'm just going to bear it. What he did, he surrendered himself. He realized he was unable. And God, the Holy Spirit, poured in strength to him. He understood God's power. See, weakness is the doorway to strength. Weakness is a doorway to strength. We're able to humble ourselves. That is the doorway to strength. He goes on to say, therefore I will boast more gladly on my weakness. Remember, he didn't want to boast about his, his visions and dreams. He, he, he was reluctant in boasting about that, but he says, you know what? Once I understand that it's through my weakness that God's grace and strength kick in, I will more gladly boast about my weaknesses. I'll more gladly boast about where I came short and how I come, how I come short. I will most gladly, and then he says there, he says, he says, and my weaknesses so that the power of Christ rest upon, may rest upon me. The power of Christ may rest upon me. And the idea is that word rest means to fix like a tent, to have a tent come above you. So in Luke chapter, chapter 9, in verse 34, the story is told of the trans, transfiguration. And it says there that, that Moses and Elijah appeared and Christ transfigured in front of them. He began, he, he began to shine and to glow as the glory of God came upon him, right? And then it says there that Peter was saying, we, we, we probably need to make a, 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 a sacrifice, a, a booth or something for each of you. And he says, all of a sudden, the glory, the Shekinah glory of the Lord overshadowed them. And they were all in the Shekinah glory of the Lord. That is the same word that he uses here for rest. It is to be overshadowed by strength and by power. And so Paul says there, what, he, what he's saying there is this, therefore I will boast most gladly of my weaknesses so that the power, that word power is dunamis. It is the same word that we get dynamite from. It is dynamite power. He says, he says, that, he says that dynamite power, this dunamis power will rest on me. This dunamis power is going to overshadow me. It's going to hover over me. It is going to cover me. It's going to consume me as God pours his power in me. Isn't that a great picture? To be, to be consumed by God's grace and consumed by God's power that God is pouring on him as a result of his weakness. He goes on in verse 10. For the sake of Christ, then I am content. Some translation says, I take pleasure with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then am I strong. When I am weak, then am I strong. He says, because of the grace of Christ. For Christ's sake. What does he mean for Christ's sake? What he's saying is this, when I become weak and I become dependent upon God, Christ's grace and Christ's power kicked in and Christ gets the glory. So for the fact of allowing Christ to be glorified through my things that I'm going through, my afflictions, I take pleasure in boasting of this because Christ is going to get glorified when people see his power working through me. Does that make sense?
It's interesting, we read the story of Paul, as Paul begins to explain this to this church. Paul probably lived, after this time, he probably lived about 10 or 11 years more. And all through his life, we are never told that God removed the thorn. He never mentions it again. We're never told that he removed it. As far as we know, with the day that God put this thorn in his life 14 years ago into the rest of his life, Paul lived with this thorn. But here's the thing. He wasn't sad about the thorn. He rejoiced in the thorn because he realized it was the thorn that God had placed in his life that was keeping him humble. It was a thorn that God had placed in his life which was stopping him from being conceited. It was a thorn that God had placed in his life that was allowing God to continue to use him to great extents. And it was a thorn that God placed in his life that was bringing Christ's glory. What does that say about some of the things that we go through? What does it say about some of the afflictions and some of the things that we deal with? As he talks about there, he talks about weaknesses, sicknesses, assaults, hardships, persecution, needs, persecutions, calamities. As he talks about, what does that say about some of those things that maybe, just maybe, God for this time, this season, has placed these things in our life because he's wanting to do something in our life. It's interesting, the grace that God gave Paul, he didn't give Paul this grace to endure the thorn. He gave Paul this grace that he might rise above the thorn, that he may take this thorn and use it in his life to trans, to, to, use in his life to, to transform his life. And it was through the thorn that he dealt with that his life was transformed. What would it, what, could it be that the things that we're dealing with in life, the afflictions that we deal with, the persecutions that we deal with, that God has placed them in our life because he is trying to transform us into the image of Christ. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. Would I choose it? I wouldn't choose it. Could I give it away if I could? I'd give it away in a minute. But just maybe God has placed it there and he's used even the enemy and maybe those people around us to place it there to develop character and to transform us into the image of Christ for the glory of God because he wants me to realize that I'm weak and I can't do it. And it's when that happens that his grace kicks in. It so reminds me of a, 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 a house we used to live in. We had, we had a generator. And what the purpose of the generator was when the electricity went off, which it went off quite a bit, electricity went off, the generator would kick on, and the generator would keep things running. Right? That, that's sort of the idea. I get it. I look at this. It's when my power is depleted, the generator kicks on. Now, here's the amazing thing about this. The generator has turbo power. It's actually stronger than the regular electricity that was running through the thing. You just don't know it's stronger, right? And you're not going to experience the, genera the generator's turbo power until you get to the place where your lights go out. And when our lights go out, that power kicks in. That power kicks in in our life. So what are some lessons we learned? Let me give you five lessons that we learned through this. One, we need to understand the danger of pride. Why did God do this? Because he did not want Paul to become conceited or proud. Because had he done that, he would not have been able to use him the way he used him. James chapter, chapter 4 verse 6 says this, but he gives more grace, therefore, he says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That word oppose is a military term which means fights against. What James is saying is God fights against the proud. 
He opposes them. When you and I are proud, we have just stepped into the boxing ring with God. And God fights against that. Now, I don't think I have to tell you this. We have zero chance of winning a fight in the boxing ring with God. Right? We're going to lose that fight. And so what happens, pride causes God to come. So we have to understand the need to understand the danger of pride. Number two, we need to know that God is sovereign over Satan. God is sovereign over Satan. There is nothing the enemy can bring in your life that God did not allow. There is nothing he can do to you unless God allows it. He is so sovereign that he uses Satan like a puppet when he chooses to. Right? We need to understand that we have a God who is sovereign over the enemy. And one of the things that the enemy uses is fear. He causes us to fear. Now, we're to respect him because we have no power against him outside of God, outside of God. But we're not to fear him. He is power, he is sovereign over the enemy. Number three, God's grace is always sufficient. God's grace is always sufficient. Say that with me. God's grace is always sufficient. Anything and everything you are going through, God's grace is always sufficient. He has enough grace to get you through it. He has enough strength to take it away. He has enough strength to help you carry it through. His grace is always sufficient, and he does everything on what is best for us. Number four, God transforms our weakness into his strengths, into his strength. He transforms our weakness into his strength. Paul basically said that his gift, that, that he basically said that his afflictions were a gift from God. Look at Look, if you would, back at verse, at verse, um, verse 7. So he kept me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. A thorn was given to me. It doesn't say a thorn was inflicted upon me. He says a thorn was given to me. Something that is given to us is a gift. Paul saw his afflictions as gifts. They were gifts. Here's the question to us. Right now, how are you seeing your trials? How are you seeing your afflictions? How are you seeing your persecutions? How are you seeing your necessities, your needs, that you're wondering whether they're going to get met? How are you seeing the insults that are coming against you? How are you seeing the physical trials that you're going through, the pains that you're going through? How are you seeing the mental and the physical and, 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 and the uh, psychological, emotional? How are you seeing those things? Now, I'm not, please understand, I'm not saying this is easy stuff. I'm not saying it's easy to, to, to convert your mind into seeing these afflictions as something as a gift. But I am saying it's possible. And I am saying that if we would allow the things that God allows into our lives to become gifts, to transform us into the image of Christ, it's going to change the way we look at them. It's going to change the impact that they have on our lives. It's going to change us. Because we're going to, instead of bearing through them, we're going to grow through them as God transforms us. Number five, last one. 
We are in desperate need of God's grace. Now, how many would you say we're in need of God's grace? Okay. And some of us will say it because we think that's the right thing to say. Right? But we are in desperate need of God's grace. If, if, if God were to take his grace from us, it would almost be like God taking breath from us. We couldn't breathe. We are in desperate need every day of God's grace. So let me just give you a couple of scriptures that, that, that talk about this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 15. Peter says, And after you have suffered a while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his, etern to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore you, confirm you, strengthen you, and establish you. After you've suffered for a while, this God who is the God of all grace is going to restore you, is going to confirm you, he's going to establish you, he's going to strengthen you. As you do that. That's why we need that grace. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then with, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. If I really believe that I'm in need of God's grace, God says, I'm going to tell you where to find it. I have a throne of grace. It says, let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may receive the grace and the mercy to help in a time of need. It, this, this is what I want us to understand. This grace that God is giving us, this grace that God has placed in our life, this grace that we so desperately need, he's not playing hide and seek with us. He's telling us where we get this grace, right? Right? He's telling us, I, 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 I have a throne that, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is full of this grace, and I want you to come boldly before this throne that you can have all the grace you're going to need to get through the things that you're going through. He's telling us how to get that grace. He's telling us the way that you get this grace to kick in your life is to admit that you're weak and understand that you can't do it. And when, admitting that you can't do it, that's when you get this grace. James chapter 4 verse 6 says this, And he gives more grace. He gives more grace. When does he give more grace? He gives more grace when we need more grace. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't get anything out of this message, I want you to get this. God will never run out of grace. He'll never run out of grace. And we all need grace. Grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. This is where this starts. Paul says, writing to, to the church of Ephesus, he says this For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Now, why did I read that passage, that, chat, that verse? Because we talked about grace. We talked about grace being sufficient. We talked about grace being strong and being strengthening. But guess what? You will never experience the sufficient grace, the strengthening grace, if you've never experienced the saving grace. Paul says in Ephesians 2, for by grace... Are you saved? Grace is God giving to us what we do not deserve. That's where, that's where it starts. And not of yourselves. There's absolutely nothing. Please understand this. There's absolutely nothing that you and I can do to be saved. We can't work hard enough. We can't pray hard enough. If we took up a bed and lived in the church, it wouldn't be enough. There's nothing we can do to be saved. By grace are you saved and not of yourselves. It is a gift. It is something that God gives you and I that we don't deserve. 
It is a gift lest any man should boast. There's not going to be anybody in heaven bragging about what they did to get there because none of us deserve to be there and none of us can do anything to get there. It is simply by grace. We are saved because God had mercy on us and sent his son Jesus Christ to die for us. And he says, if you would accept Christ, if you would believe Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I will save you. There's absolutely nothing you and I do for that but believe. If you're here today and you have never accepted Jesus Christ, you, you, you can't say to me, Pastor Clark, you know what? If I were to die tonight, I know where I would go. I'm confident I would go to heaven. If, if you're not sure, you need to make sure. You need to make sure because there's one guarantee in this life. Actually, there's two guarantees in this life. Hebrews, chapter, Hebrews, Hebrews 9 tells us this. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after death, the judgment. Those are the two guarantees. Every single one of us is going to die one day. You have a 100% chance of dying. And after death, every single one of us is going to stand before a holy God. And God's not going to be concerned about what church you went to. He's not going to be concerned about uh, whether you were baptized or how you served or who your mama was or who your pastor was. He's not, he's not concerned about that. He's going to be concerned about one thing. I sent my son to die for you. Did you ever accept him? Did you ever ask forgiveness of your sins and ask him into your life? Right? Those are the only two guarantees. We're going we're to die and we're going to stand before God. And we stand before God. The only answer is that there's nothing i done that deserved to be heaven. It is simply by your grace. It is God's saving grace. Listen, today, if you've not accepted, if you've not experienced God's grace, I want you to experience that. I really do. Let me have every head bowed. Every head bowed. And for those of you who know Jesus Christ right now, you just pray. You just pray. If you're here today and you are not sure of your salvation, maybe you think you are, maybe, maybe you hope you are, you can't say for sure, if I die tonight, I would go to heaven. I want you to know how much God loves you. And I'm going to lead in a prayer. And get, understand, this prayer does not save anybody. This prayer is not magical. But what it is, it is a sinner crying out to God saying, Lord, I need you. I'm dependent upon you for my salvation. And I'm trusting you for my salvation. And so if God is leading you just, just where you are, right where you are, I, just, I, 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 I want you to voice this prayer to God. You voice this prayer to God. Put everybody else out of your mind and voice this prayer to God. Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner. And I can't be good enough to save myself. I believe Jesus Christ died for me and rose again. And right now, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is what I want you to do. If you prayed this prayer, maybe you prayed this prayer for the first time, maybe it's been before, on the back of your sheets, there should be some cards. We want you to take and, and, and fill out those cards. You stop me at the door. You stop one of the ministers here, Minister Josh, and, and you let us know that today I prayed that prayer to accept Jesus Christ in my life. Praise team.